from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Our book editor for the Washington Post. It's a great pleasure to see you all here. This is a, an event that the Post has sponsored for all nine years of its existence. Uh, I'm supposed to tell you before we begin here that um, the Library of Congress would like you to know that if you step up to uh, ask a question at the mic, uh, once we start the question and answer period, that you should know you are being filmed and your words and face will go into posterity. So just to warn you, you'll be in the archives forever. <laughs> it's a very special honor for me to be introducing someone I not only consider a good friend, but a marvelous writer who has broken barriers and paved the way for so many other writers in America. <laughs> Julia Alvarez, or Julia Alvarez, however she accepts, whichever way you say it, has played that kind of pilgrim's role in American letters. She is one of the most successful Latina writers of her time. As you will see when she actually steps up here, she's bird delicate, tiny, but don't let that fool you. There is a force about Julia in her passion, in her urgency, in her outrage, reminiscent of other diminutive, tiny writers with large things on their minds. Joan Didion, Joyce Carol Oates, Nadine Gordimer. Julia has been famous for almost a generation now, since the publication of How the Garcia Girls Lost Their Accent. She's been working at writing for almost 40 years, challenging herself at every turn, daring herself to remain relevant and new. She was born in New York City during her parents' first attempt to relocate to North America, they were Dominican Republicans, somewhat at bay in the teeming, unwelcoming streets of the city. So they decided to return to raise their children in Santo Domingo. But her father became so implicated in the rebel underground against the infamous dictatorship of General Rafael Trujillo that the family was forced to escape to America three months before that underground's founders the Mirabal sisters, known as the Butterflies, were led to a cane field and brutally strangled. Alvarez was 10 years old at the time. It was from the lives of the Mirabal sisters that Alvarez eventually fashioned her stirring political novel in the time of the Butterflies. That book was a radical departure from Garcia Girls, redefining her as a writer who wanted to do more than record immigrant experiences. Since then, she has written poetry, a book of, of essays about identity, a fascinating novel about a Dominican poet, and a spate of children's and young adult fiction. Every time she produces a new book, it seems she has something very different to say. Her most recent novel, which weighs the relevance of a writer in the larger world, is called Saving the World and it concerns Dr. Francisco de Balmis, a Spanish doctor who in 1803 organized the first worldwide medical expedition to eradicate diseases. Balmis was set forth with the Spanish king's blessing in a public relations mission meant to win back the colonists' heart during a fractious, rebellious time. This was just before the revolutions and the wars of independence in Latin America. The object was smallpox which had by then cut a deadly course in the world. Balmis traveled from Spain to Colombia to Ecuador, Venezuela, Peru, Mexico, Philippines, and China, carrying the cure in the form of 22 orphan boys who harbored the vaccine in vivo. It was, after all, before the age of refrigeration. Thousands and thousands of lives were saved. Perhaps it's Alvarez's passion for teaching, she's taught English at Middlebury College for many years, that predisposes her to think of books as an opportunity to explain the world. Her latest book, Once Upon a, Once Upon a Quinceañera, Coming of Age in the U.S., 
is about that quintessential ritual in Latino life, La Quinceañera, uh, the, celebra the celebration that honors 15-year-old girls and the start of womanhood. But she places that Latin American rite of passage here on red, white, and blue soil where the tradition still continues. I don't think there's any doubt that Latino life has two firm feet in the United States of America now. And I can't think of anyone better than Julia Alvarez to tell us exactly what that means. Please welcome the truly wonderful Julia Alvarez. I want Maria to promise here in front of all of you that she's going to speak at my funeral <laughs> <laughs> and, and say such wonderful things about me. Uh, it's wonderful to be here, really wonderful to be here. And as I was standing there, I wanted to be sure I had turned my cell phone off because I just got a call in the bathroom from my older sister. Uh, and, uh, you know, I thought she'd ask, so how'd it go? You know, a lot of people buying your books. How's it going? And she asked me, so have you met him yet? Have you met him? Obama. That's all she cares about. I said, Maudie, I'm about to go on. Don't you want to wish me good luck? You haven't met him? <laughs> That's why we have families, right? <clears throat> but thank you, Maria Rana. That's a, that's a wonderful introduction, so generous. It says more about Marie, really, than it says about me. Uh, I wrote some things down, uh, which will help me focus. Uh, I get kind of a little bit, I, when I'm working on a book, you all aren't there. And this is a little amazing to see you all out there. So I, I wrote some, some words down, and I hope there's time also for us to have a conversation, any questions you might have. So it's great to be here in the fiction and fantasy tent, though I admit that whenever I'm assigned a literary denomination, I always feel a little bit of magpie syndrome. I think it's the magpie that lays its eggs in other people's nests, other birds' nests, because I'm never sure if I'm in the right place. Am I a genuine fiction writer? Or should I be in the poetry tent? Or maybe a children's literature or YA? Mostly, I feel honored to be here with my fellow writers under our various tents as we celebrate our songs and our poems and our stories, our waters and our watering place, those spaces only stories and poems make accessible to all of us. But while I'm here, since I won't be reading from the book, and these are the people paying for me to be here, I, I have to hold up my, my new uh, book, YA book, is uh, Return to Sender, about um, the immigrant experience that we're now having in Vermont. Most of the uh, milking and the dairy farms is, are being, is being done now by uh, undocumented Mexican migrant workers. And when I moved to Vermont 21 years ago, my um, Latino friends would joke that I was moving to the Latino compromised state of Vermont. In the 2001 census, we had 5,504 people of Hispanic origin in all of the state of Vermont. This is, there are that many people of Hispanic origin here today. <laughs> so uh, this is something new in Vermont. Uh, and I was called to a lot of the schools to uh, translate for the kids of these migrant workers. So that's how I got involved with the story that I tell in this um, Return to Sender. And then um, my latest adult novel, Saving the World, that Marie talked about uh, is also, this publisher is also here uh, supporting me bringing me here to you. So one thing I didn't know was that the National Book Festival, the first one, was in 2001, three days before September 11th. And it sort of gave me goosebumps, and you'll see why, because I just found this out last night, and I had written this before I came here. So um, two weeks ago, we marked the eighth anniversary of September 11th. The proximity of that anniversary with this National Book Festival brought up some reflections which I'd like to share with you today at this festival where we've gathered together to celebrate the liberating power of reading and writing. 
I guess the thing that struck me <clears throat> was how if you had to pick the exact opposite of the sad events of 9-11, it would be this festival. What happened on 9-11 was a tragic gesture of hate and violence. We Americans wondered why anyone would want to hurt us in this way. Some horrible lack of comprehension and compassion had taken place. I know that I and many of my fellow writers have done a lot of soul searching in the days and years following 9-11. I know that I have wondered many times about my role as a storyteller in this changed world. Often, we think that in order to advance the cause of freedom, we have to do grand things. But in fact, and I know this from writing in the time of the butterflies, we become brave almost by accident. Something happens and we respond to that challenge courageously and compassionately. But really, all along the way to that something big happening, we've been cultivating a compassionate heart, a listening and big-hearted imagination. And I truly think that one of the ways to cultivate such an elastic and inclusive imagination is by reading books. That is why I feel heartened by seeing all of us coming together to celebrate an activity which is profoundly important in today's world. In fact, I believe reading and sharing of stories offers us a way through the debris of what has come tumbling down. Think about it. When you read, you become someone else. Terence, the Roman slave and playwright who freed himself with his writings once wrote, I am a human being. Nothing human is alien to me. That could be the motto of literature. Nothing human is alien to the pen of a novelist. And when we read, nothing human is alien to us either. We become all different kinds of people. A Danish prince trying to make a decision about what moral code to follow. A young black girl named Maya Angelou growing up in the rural south in the 1930s. A grief-stricken King Gilgamesh searching for his lost friend Ankidu in the underworld in 2700 BC. A beautiful young freedom fighter named Minerva Mirabal forming an underground movement in the 1950s in the dictatorship of Trujillo in the Dominican Republic. See what I mean? Reading, we enter deeply into the lives of others. We live their lives, we think their thoughts, we feel their feelings. We practice an activity which promotes compassion and human understanding. In fact, I would go as far as to say that by reading books together, entering other realities, and then taking the lessons learned in those adventures back into our own lives, we are freedom fighters. I remind you that one of the first things that happens in a dictatorship is that books are confiscated. People are not permitted to congregate to share ideas and stories. There is one official story, one text, one reason to gather together, and that is for indoctrination. I know because I live that reality in a dictatorship. You know it because you have lived that reality perhaps in a novel I've written or in other novels you've read about similar situations. Toni Morrison once said that the function of freedom is to free someone else. And I can't think of a better way to pass on that freedom than to make someone else a reader and put a good book in his or her hands. So you're probably thinking, of course this Julia Alvarez author person thinks so because she's a writer probably an avid reader. And you're right. My husband laughs at me because we go to the gas station and there's a book tucked away in my purse. Just in case, I tell him. I leave to go to the grocery store and stick the latest New Yorker in my satchel. Uh, are you going shopping or to do some reading over at Shaw's? He teases me. A few years ago, the Children's Book Council asked me if I'd write the little poem on their annual bookmark. I know I'm in the fiction and fantasy tent, not the children's tent, but their theme was uh, More Books, Please, and they give you the title, and it's, it's a, it was a theme that seemed chosen just for me. And here's the little poem I wrote uh, for the children's uh, bookmark of that year. 
I get tired of baseball, butterflies, bumblebees, of shopping at malls, of climbing tall trees. I'm filled up with family, tios, tias, and such. Halloween's birthday parties, it's a little too much. Enough servings of summer. Spring flowers make me sneeze. Cold weather's a bummer. I'd leave with a geese. But no matter how many stories I read, I never feel any desire to cease. So when, after seconds, I'm done with life's feast, please carve on my tombstone more books, please. <laughs> <laughs> So now I'm a reader, but it might surprise you if I told you that I didn't begin life that way. Growing up, I was a terrible student. I flunked every grade through fifth grade and had to attend summer school. Partly it was that growing up female in the 50s in the Dominican Republic, I wasn't expected to get much of an education at all. My grandmother, who only went up to fourth grade, used to tell the story that she only picked up a book when she heard the teacher's donkey braying as it came up the road to her house. I was my grandmother's grandchild. I was not a reader. I was growing up in the dictatorship of Trujillo, in the kind of world that I depict in my novel In the Time of the Butterflies. In a school just down the road from where I was going to school, a student wrote an essay in which he praised Trujillo, our dictator, as the father of our country. The teacher commented that certainly Trujillo was one of the fathers of our country, but there were others. The boy, the son of a general, must have gone home and told his father. That night, the teacher, his wife, and his two young children disappeared. And so I grew up in a world where ideas were censored, where owning books made you suspect as an intellectual and a troublemaker. But one thing the dictator could not repress was the irrepressible need of the human creature for stories. Though every media outlet was censored, television, radio, publishing, they were all under the control of the dictator and his secret police, still the stories came out through what people popularly called Radio Bemba, Radio Big Mouth. <laughs> yes, I didn't grow up with schools or with readers, but I grew up with amazing storytellers that's what happens in an oral culture. So I grew up in a rich oral culture, but it was not a culture that encouraged reading or independent thinking. In fact, had we not emigrated to the United States, I probably would never have become a reader or, or the writer I am today. In 1960, my family fled the country as political refugees. We arrived in New York City on August 6, 1960. I was 10 years old. Less than four months later, the Mirabar sisters who had started the underground my father was a part of were murdered. At the time, I didn't know how lucky we had been. All I could see were the losses. Overnight, we had lost everything. Our country, our home, our extended family structure, our economic security, our language, we arrived in this country at a time in history that was not very welcoming to people who were different, whose skins were a different color, whose language didn't sound like English. For the first time in my life, I experienced prejudice and playground cruelty, which was no big deal when compared to the devastating cruelty of grown men back where we had come from. But when you're a child, such experiences can be crushing. I struggled with a language and a culture I didn't understand. I was heartbroken and heartsick. But sometimes it is in those hard moments in your life that they can become opportunities for expansion and self-creation. Because I felt so isolated, I discovered books and the world of the imagination where everyone was welcome, the table set for all, the portable homeland where no one was barred, all of the things I've been talking about here today. One thing led to another. I became a reader, and the more I read, the more I wanted to contribute to this great treasure house of stories, what we're celebrating here today. I dreamed of mastering English, of becoming an American writer. And where did I go to nurture this dream? 
the public library. I couldn't believe this incredible place filled with books you could borrow. We had come from a dictatorship where the generous general populace was not to be trusted with books. Here was a country in which you were given free access, not just to textbooks or doctrinaire biographies and histories, but to fun books about young girl detectives and runaway boys on rafts on a river whose name was impossible to spell or say, except slowly, syllable by syllable, Miss Is Ippy. <laughs> People born into this birthright often don't realize what an incredible privilege and resource this is. Speaking personally, I can say that I never would have become a writer if I hadn't had access to the American treasure house of public libraries, access to books, access to people who could guide me in this new world we had come to, librarians. As <laughs> As a, as a young, newly arrived immigrant to the USA and to the world of books, I fell in love with poetry. Maybe it was because the cadence English of poetry was more musical, more like my native language of Spanish. At any rate, I fell in love with poetry. Any poem I love, I memorized it, recited it to myself, treated it as a little message in a bottle I retrieved from my castaway li new life in the United States of America. In one of the many books I took out of the library, there was a little poem that meant a great deal to me, I Too Sing America by Langston Hughes. You see, even though I dreamed of becoming an American writer, I couldn't really find any books in English about people like me or books written by people like me. Remember, this was the United States of the early 60s, still locked in the civil rights struggle, pre-women's movement, pre-equal rights amendment, pre-multicultural studies, pre-anything but the melting pot, that old assimilationist mainstreaming model. And so the message to me was that although the underlying truth of everything I was reading was, I am a human being, nothing human is alien to me, still there were big gaps in that shelf of American literature. But then, in one of the books, as I mentioned, among absent voices and missing stories, I found the Langston Hughes poem, I Too Sing America. And now that poem resonates in such a big way, this being the first um, festival that is chaired by President Barack Obama and Michelle Obama. So it resonates. Um, this little poem, and I'm going to read it to you. I too sing America. I am the darker brother. They send me to eat in the kitchen when company comes, but I laugh and eat well and grow strong. Tomorrow, I'll be at the table when company comes. Nobody will dare say to me, eat in the kitchen, then. Besides, they'll see how beautiful I am and be ashamed. I, too, am America. That was... That was music to my ears. I understood what Mr. Hughes was saying. He was claiming his place in the chorus of American song, an America that was still not listening to him, still treating him as a second-class literary citizen sent to the kitchen of minor writers, instead of allowing him a place at the table of American literature. But no matter, Mr. Hughes knew that tomorrow he'd be at the table. This was an important voice for a young girl of another culture and language and background with her heart full of dreams to hear. So a promise made to me in a poem by a black poet I didn't know in a book I took out of the library kept alive in my heart the possibility that I too might someday sing America. What an amazing power books can have on us. That is what we are celebrating here today. We gather to acknowledge the liberating power of story and the intrinsic democracy of reading. These festivals are grassroots movements that can lead us through dark times. And for me, what an incredible journey this has been, from a dictatorship in the Dominican Republic to a United States 
where I had to master a new language and spend years upon years reading and writing and dreaming until here I am in our nation's capital addressing you. Yes, Mr. Hughes, you were right. We too sing America. So thank you. If you have any questions or remarks. Miss Alvarez, sí. a bienvenida a Washington, Ay, DC. gracias. <laughs> sí. Debería de haber dado la bienvenida también en español. En español, sí. Yes. Uh, yo soy puertorriqueña, ah. pero mis padres son dominicanos. And I will translate for all the um, well, non-Spanish speakers in, in the audience. I am Puerto Rican of Dominican parents. And I don't have a question. I just want to uh, thank you for mm. bringing to light the story of the Mirabal sisters in the time for the butterflies. I thank you. Um, my mother gave me the book in Spanish um, wow. before, well before there was an English version of it. And I just wanted to thank you for that. Hi, thank you. Thank you. Oh. Hi, thank you for being here. Uh, two years ago, I was a high school English teacher in North Carolina, in Johnston County. And my colleague in the room next to me was teaching how the Garcia girls lost their accent when a parent complained and the, the book story. was banned. In fact, both of your books, uh, In the Time of the Butterflies as well, were banned and pulled from our curriculum. With everything you've just said, could you speak for a moment about censorship? Yes, I can. I'm, I, I actually read about a week ago an amazing letter by a librarian um, uh, writing to a patron who wanted a, a book pulled from the children's section. Uh, Daddy's getting married or something like that. It felt it was inappropriate. It was the most beautiful letter. And I, I, I sent it to all my librarian friends and I thought, why did I do that? They know this already. It's, it, I had to go down to Richmond last year because how the Garcia girls uh, lost their accents was banned. And uh, I went and spoke to the community and spoke with a lot of these parents. Uh, many of the parents had not read the book. Somebody had taken passages yes. or said there in, in the book, How the Garcia Girls uh, Lost Their Accents, there is a pedophile scene. Well, I just, I had to go look up in the dictionary because I thought there is. I thought I know what pedophile meant. There is a pedophile scene. And there's a scene in the, in the book in which the young girl that's an immigrant gets stopped by a man who flashes her. And she is so distraught, she goes home, and the mom calls the cops, and she can't describe what she saw because she doesn't have English. So it's about, the, you know, when you don't have language to express something that's the horror, the horror, and how we need our stories, and how we need language to understand experience so that we can survive it. And that was the pedophile scene. So another parent got up and they said, well, you know, um, your books, maybe she read, read them, she used the plural. So she said, your books, there, there's so many gray areas. Our young people need black and white. And I said, you know what? Your kids should not be reading literature. Literature is all about the gray areas, how we're all these mixtures as human beings. And I've also been an educator, so you know, I can't just say, oh, to hell with them. Because one of the things you learn as an educator is that the classroom is a space where everybody has to be welcome. So, are, so is the world of stories. It's ever expansive. Anybody can sit down at this table. That's why I wanted to be a writer. It was that great democracy. And I tell these, I, I, I feel like it's important to engage these parents because they're creating the non-readers of the future or the, or the censors of the future to say, you know, I'm an educator. It's so important for our kids that it, experiences like this are gonna happen to them out there. When you read, when you're in a classroom talking about these books, you've created a space 
in which they can learn how to speak about these things, how to understand these things, how to, that's the great protection against the violence of the world, that you have a way to understand the experience and to manage it. So it's important for our kids to be exposed to things and have the safe space in which they're able to read about it, talk about it, but it's so, it's so difficult. And I think, you know, part of the thing is, I talked to some of the librarians and some of the teachers about creating a reading club for the parents. <laughs> you know, in which they, they really see what happens when you, because to me those are people that are not readers. They're not really readers. They, they want things black and white. And that's not what literature is about. It's about the complexity. Thank but you. it is difficult, and hats off to you teachers because you're in the front lines there. And it's so, it's so disempowering to have, you know, you're, you're, you're there because you have a skill and you have a calling, and to be circumscribed in that. And yet, you know, this is an opportunity to educate those parents, too. Difficult, yes. Uh, hello, thank you, Julia. Well, muchas gracias de otra vez. Um, I wanted to, um, to, first of all, say that as a Colombian who's lived nine years in Venezuela, um, recently, about, two, well, two years ago, we were in a special um, contest where we had to read many books and answer questions. One of the books that we had was the um, one about the, um, Before We Were Free. Oh, Before and, We Were Free. And um, I read it about six to eight times, more or less, but wow, <laughs> you, you've read it more times than I have, and I wrote Thank the you. book. <laughs> <laughs> but every time I read it, I felt a deeper and deeper meaning, and so I felt a lot closer to this. So I wanted to ask you, have you ever felt of yourself when you wrote those kind of books as a role model to other, not only adults, but also teenagers who are not uh, necessarily American, but are from, are from somewhere else. Have you ever felt of yourself as a role model to them? I really, I, I, I hope I don't, uh, I, you know, uh, I, maybe I should, but I don't feel like a model. I, I feel like um, I disappear when I'm working and I'm just doing the work that I feel passionate about and I feel very lucky to do. and. I think that that's really what should be the model. And I teach this to my students. You know, you, you, you teach at a college like Middlebury, and the parents are paying a lot of money for the kids to go there. And I'm, I'm telling them, you know, I, when you leave here, I don't want you to be famous. I don't want you to be important. I don't want you to make tons of money. I want you to find your calling, the thing that you're passionate doing. So that is something, that is something that if I can model that, but it doesn't matter what you do, as long as it's your calling. It's only later when somebody says to me that a book has meant a lot to them, or that they found themselves in a book, that I feel like I did my work well. But that just says, get back to work to me. <laughs> you know, I come to these festivals and I, when they're about to end, I get really anxious. It's like the bar has gone up, you know, I'm, I, I didn't know I was responsible to all of you to, um, <laughs> to really keep growing as a writer, and, and you've reminded me. So that, that, is, um, that is something that when you come to these festivals, it's wonderful. It, it's a little um, anxiety producing too, because you, you know that you, you're, you have a sacred trust. You have many things to do. Um, life is complicated. So many good books to read. Uh, just, just being at this festival, I have my list is growing. And, uh, and if you read one of my books, I want it to be the best that I can do. So thank you. Thank you. Gracias. <laughs> Hi, um, my name is Ligia Abreu. I'm like the two previous questioners. I'm from the Dominican Republic. I moved here about six years ago. And, uh, Witnessing in the fa past five years, not only your books, which are beautiful, and my mother started giving me when I was in my early teens, when I was in high school, and um, I've read pretty much all of them except Quinceañera, so love them. 
uh, not only your books, but also Juno Diaz yes. and In the Heights and just seeing this rise of Dominican culture kind of in mainstream America has been incredibly inspiring. And I think for Latin American and immigrant youth in the United States in general, not just for Dominican kids. And I think even though it's gonna be a little anxiety inducing, I suppose my question is, do you feel like part of your drive is to share a little bit of your culture and the island with people who might never go there and might not know it as anything but, I guess, the birthplace of many baseball players? <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, I, the question was, do I feel like th this is, this is something you want to do, like Salome and the Garcia girls and... Well, you know, I think that one of the things is that you can't help but tell the stories that are in you to tell. You know, uh, when, I, when I was starting to be a young writer, I, I felt like the American literature that I was reading, that all my characters, if I had a Tia Rosa, she had to become Aunt Rose. She had to get her green card to come into American literature, that it had to be a certain... <laughs> And that was only, that also only falsified because, you know, think about that metaphor of the great campfire where we're all gathered with all the storytellers. But each of these storytellers is coming from their little tribe, you know, and they're telling the stories that surge out of their experience, the stories that captivate them, the stories that they haven't read in books before. So this is what you bring and you contribute to the big circle. So, you know, it's almost like, where else would I go to find my stories. And, and that's not always true because I write also, I mean, in uh, Return to Sender, uh, one of the characters is a farm boy, Tyler, you know, from a French-Canadian family. So that's not really me. But <laughs> I heard Julia Glass say something that was wonderful about, um, about writing fiction. She says, um, all, all fiction is emotionally autobiographical. So that even if you're not telling the stories of your little tribe, Something about where you grew up, the dynamics uh, that came to create your psyche and personality and history uh, intrigue you, and where you find those um, other stories that pull you, there's something emotionally autobiographical about it. But I think it's also, you know, I heard Terry Gross interview um, Toni Morrison and, and said, Toni, when, when are you going to write about white people? <laughs> Ooh. You know, it was radio, but I heard a load of silence. <laughs> it was palpable. And she said, you know, white people have their story, storytellers, and there's so many stories that I have to tell of my people, and I'm the person to do those stories, and not to judge or say some are better than others, or that a storyteller can't tell a story of a fictional character if, it's not, if they're not of that ethnicity or that gender because wonderful things happen with the imagination. What Terence, the playwright, said, you know, you, be, you can become, nothing human is alien to you. But I think we have a predisposition to tell those stories that we haven't seen before. And it's, it's wonderful you say your mother gave you my books. That's how I know I'm getting older. <laughs> you know, my readers used to say, oh, I just discovered you, <laughs> wonderful writer. And then they started saying, you know, my mom really <laughs> loves your books. And now I've gotten a few, my grandmother really loves your books. Just as long as the generations keep reading me, I'm fine. Thank you. Thank you. Um, hello, um, I'm Edward Tatum, and um, my mother's Dominican and my dad's from the Cayman Islands uh, Caribbean. And um, I just want to thank you, really, for creating a book that, um, how should I put it, that, you know, a lot of mainstream media, you know, what everybody reads, you know, uh, these novels that really don't have any artistic merit, that uh, kind of mimic each other, you put something out there that um, people of color and also people who are different skin colors can unite and read together and find common ground on. I, I just think that it's amazing that um, you, you actually, you don't mimic what other people do because there's a lot of people out here who are writing books that are the same, uh, such as, you know, hip hop novels that really, they don't have any artistic merit at all. And I, I just think is that it's amazing that you defy what, um, how should I put, what everybody wants because your, your art is a reflection of man, you know, of, of yourself. 
and I just think that it's, it's, it's amazing, and I, I really thank you for well, that. Well, thank you. Well, I, I, wish, uh, I, I, I wish that I, I, I did have more uh, people buying my books then. <laughs> if I'm uh, not like all those bestsellers, but I, I think there are wonderful writers out there. And any of us who's a writer, any of us, us, any of us that achieve anything, we're standing on a lot of shoulders. So I, you know, I've learned a lot from, from writers that are gone, long dead writers, and I've learned a lot from my contemporaries, and I'm constantly learning from them and feel sometimes humbled by the great work that is out there. Mm -hmm. um, and there are certainly some wonderful writers here uh, this festival whom I greatly admire, and I feel honored to be in this tent with some of my favorites. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Alvarez, thank you so much for being here. I've really enjoyed your books, and I was really pleased, I think it was last year, that Roundhouse Theater in Bethesda put on uh, How the Garcia Girls Lost Their Accents. It was a wonderful production. So I hope that other theaters pick that up too. That, yeah, your question, sorry. No, it must have been wonderful for you to have seen that. Well, I'm thinking, and I don't know if she's here, uh, the actress that played Fifi yeah. uh, is maybe in the audience. I, I, I just met her at lunch. She was great. And it was a wonderful production. Uh, of how the Garcia girls lost their accents because they, I, I didn't know how they were going to do this. I, I didn't either. I thought they it was went, you know, they went backwards in time, just as in the plot. Yeah. And so the the, the uh, actresses' costumes changed, and they became younger and younger and younger. And then they were young little girls, and you could believe it. But the amazing scene is the last scene takes place totally in Spanish. Yeah. So. It, it was amazing, and the, the director, you know, um, yeah. and Anglo was a little nervous about, was, was he going to lose the audience? And later, we were talking to people who were there who did not speak Spanish, and they said, you know, by the time that scene came, I felt like I understood, I understood <laughs> them. Because there was something about getting into the vocabulary and language. I mean, that's what great actors and actresses do. Exactly. So it was an amazing and an amazing leap to take, and, and <laughs> Ooh. Oh, my goodness. My goodness. Sound effects, and it yeah. still works. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Overtime. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.